Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Let's, uh, let's get into tonight's message. We're going to be te- we're, we're getting into the second chapter of the book of 2 Timothy. Hallelujah. And um, I think we kind of tried to start into that yesterday, and it just, I mean, just yes, last week, and just didn't have a chance to really do it right. So let's go. Thou therefore, my son, be strong. Hallelujah. In the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. Um, and then, I, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful witnesses, who shall be able to teach others also. In other words, Paul was telling Timothy his responsibility was to take the things he had learned and pass it on to other faithful men. We talked about that a little bit last week. We don't pass it on to unfaithful people. We, our, we, we pass it on to faithful people. Hallelujah. And then he goes on, and Paul uses uh, three different illustrations here uh, in the next verse. Um, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warth entangling himself within the affairs of this life, that he may please him who's called him to be a soldier. And if a man also strive for masteries, he, he, and he's not crowned, except he strive lawfully. And the husband that laboreth must be partaker of the fruits. And then, so let's look at this here. He uses three illustrations in life to talk about the word hardness means hardship. Uh, the adjective good means noble or excellent. So a soldier is called to endure the hardship and rigors of battle. Ever say that the, the, you know, the soldier is called to endure the hardship and rigors of battle. Uh, as a good soldier... In, of Jesus Christ. Timothy would suffer hardship. That is, includes, that includes persecution, misunderstanding, and opposition. I thought, my God, I sure understand that. You know, you get misunderstood. You get persecuted, you know. You get, oppre- you get oppressed, you know. But I, I think one of the biggest things that I've dealt with in ministry is misunderstanding. People misinterpret your, your intentions. Um, of course, they got a devil on their shoulder telling them to misinterpret. That gets a little help there, you know. Um, but the... Um, when Paul says there's no one you know, serving as a soldier gets involved in civilian affairs, he wants to please his commanding officer. The emphasis here is not a renunciation of family, friends, home, and business. All the charismatics say, help me, Jesus. Because we can get crazy about stuff. But a caution against preoccupation with things that entangle. The Greek is um, implicatia, implicatia, implicatia which means become entangled or involved, used only here and then in 2 Peter 2.20. The caution does not mean the affairs of life are wrong. They are wrong when they entangle and keep believers from the priority of pleasing God. Um, so being a soldier demands sacrifice, discipline, obedience, and an uncompromising loyalty. So I've seen people get, you know, well, I don't have anything to do with my family because I'm, you know, I'm, you know, you're a nut, you know? You don't, you don't do anything. You know, people can get so crazy with stuff instead of looking at it in the, within the context and balance of how it's being presented by the, by the word of God. Okay? Uh, so, no, you're not to write off your family because you got saved. You know? You're not to write off life because you got saved. You know? I don't, I don't do anything, but, you know, I mean, I've heard people say stupid stuff like, you know, husbands, wives, they don't have sex because they're too busy serving the Lord. Well, you're stupid. You're just stupid, you know? And I don't, you know, you can, call, you can say I'm being mean, but you are being stupid. All right. Um, next verse says, if you strive for masteries. Now, here we move from the, um, the illustration of a soldier to that of an athlete. Now, you know, the, athlete, the, the Olympic Games were very obviously prominent in the Roman Empire. And um, this is a means to compete as, a, as an athlete. Strive for mastery means to compete with a, as an athlete. So if a man competes as an athlete, he's not crowned except he strive lawfully. As, um, unless he follows the rules, you don't get the benefits. You cheat, you get kicked out. Okay? You can't cheat in the things of God. All right? So the Greek nominos... Athletes refers to the professional athlete, not an amateur. We're talking about Christians who are serving God and, and discipline. Paul referring to the Olympic Games. Um, they tra- athletes train hard. They train long. Winners of various contests became national heroes. If a contestant cheated to gain advantage, he was discovered. He was publicly shamed and barred for the game. Each athlete had to adhere to the, the, strictly to the rules. As believers, we had to adhere to the word of God to win in life. Can I get bobblehead? 
All right. And then the third illustration Paul uses here is a farmer. Okay? So he's done, he's done soldier, he's done athlete, now he's going to do a farmer. All right? Why? Because he's using allegories that will hit somebody somehow. They'll, they'll be able to relate to it. All right? Um, he says here, the, if uh, the husbandman that laboreth must be first partaker of the fruits. And so here we have um, the, the third illustration is a hardworking farmer. Laboreth in the Greek is koipointa, which denotes hard, diligent toil. The farmer works hard because he expects to partake of the crops. He must plant, cultivate, water, weed, and wait. Then, in the time of harvest, he must toil long and hard again. What? Because he wants to bring in the harvest. I tell you, if you've ever seen um, if you, uh, out in the Midwest when they're going to bring in the, the wheat or the corn, or, or you know, the, the, the huge, they got these huge uh, combines. And they'll just sit there, and they'll sit there, and they'll, have, you know, and they'll start looking at the... Um, at the different crops and saying, well, it's getting close. They keep checking them. They keep checking them. Now, listen, those farmers all have all those combines fueled up, mechanically checked out, all ready to roll. Why? Because when it hits peak, they go out there and they just run night and day. They just keep shifting guys in and out of the combines and, and, and the trucks, that they're taking all that stuff. They just run that thing wide open until all that gets in. Why? If you wait too long, you'll lose it in the field. They could have done all that work and lose the grain right out there in the field because it, it changes that fast. All right? So they're prepared. And so if you're going to, be, if you're going to harvest, you've got to be prepared to bring in the harvest. Amen? Hallelujah. It's not just enough to get it in the ground. It's not just enough to get it watered. It's not just enough to get it growing. You've got to be ready for when the harvest comes too. So now Paul has used uh, these three different allegories and he tells Timothy, consider what I say. The Lord give you understanding in all these things. In other words, you're a good soldier. You're, uh, you're, you're striving properly like an athlete, and you're toiling, and you're ready and prepared for the harvest like a farmer, okay? So Paul says, consider me, put your mind on, and, and implies that Timothy should grasp the meaning of these things. Hallelujah. And then verse 8 says, remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead. All right, now Paul begins to change his, his, what his topic or what he's talking about here, and he moves over to... Um, uh, talking about Jesus as the seed of David, points to his humanity and encourages Timothy to remember that Jesus was a man tempted like everyone else. So he says, you know, um, that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead according to my gospel, wherein I suffer trouble. Uh, I, as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. And so Paul says, he, you know, uh, wherein, that is the gospel from the previous verse, he is bound as an evildoer, just like a common criminal. They took him and treated him like a common criminal. What do you think about what's going on in our country today? You know, dear Lord. And, um, you know, the two other Testament people that Jesus referred to when he was crucified, there the words translated malefactors. Um, bonds that he's in means fetters or chains. And from his own present suffering and, and bondage, Paul still could proclaim that the word of God is not bound. It's not held back. It's not stopped. Putting me in prison didn't stop the word of God. Thank God. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Therefore, I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may be also obtained the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. Um, for the sake of the gospel, for its proclamation, Paul does this. Elect means chosen or, uh, means chosen or choice. It does not refer to, as the Calvinists say, an elect, elite group. You know, they're, they're, this is the elect. They're the ones who are actually going to get saved. The rest of you are going to hell. Uh, that's just error. Um, it does refer to all Christians. The following phrases verify this. You know, the word salvation is connected with in Christ Jesus. And he added the words with eternal glory. This refers to the final state of salvation. It is a faithful saying. For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer with him. Uh, or suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he will also deny us. So Paul, you know, these verses here, 11 and then verse 13, if we believe not yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. We have a, a um, three-verse passage here, and it compromises the faithful saying. All these are faithful sayings that are considered um, by many Christian scholars to be lines from a Christian hymn. Um, of the five faithful sayings in the pastoral epistles, um, this is the longest. If we be dead, as the Greek A.R.T. tense that refers on a specific act in the past could be rendered, if we died with him. So it's not, you know, you know we, we, uh, I'll be honest with you, 
a lot of the stuff we do and, and, and teach, is not, it, it comes out kind of off balance a little bit because we don't take the time to study. Right. And we don't get the right tenses of things. And, you know, um, we, don't, we don't get that. And so we got, people get caught up sometimes on certain aspects, and they're a little off because they didn't really study. Here, it means if we be dead with him. Okay? All right? It says here, uh, if we be dead, really meaning if we, ha- if we die with him. When did we die with him? When he died on the cross. When were we raised? When he was raised up. Okay? Hallelujah. Uh, they could refer to his death on the cross or Christian baptism. All right? Now, if we suffer, it's better if we endure. Okay? Remember, it says here, if we suffer, we shall also. Yeah, I know people who teach on suffering, and they'll use the scripture, if we suffer. Really, you know, you gotta understand where that word comes from. It comes from a Greek word, and that word means to endure. Okay? The same Greek word is translated endure in verse 10. Back up here, you know, talk about we endure all things. Um, here the verb is the Greek present tense, which indicates a, a sustained activity. Suffering is important, but endurance is more important. Now, in other words, this, we're going we're to encounter suffering. But how you endure, now remember we, te- we teach on hupomino, the Greek word hupomino, which means uh, to, to endure, but but really a better understanding of how it comes across is in remain steadfast. You don't waver. You're not wavering in your faith. You're not wavering in what you believe. You're not wavering in your stand. So you remain steadfast. Okay? Um, goes on says, if we deny him, it, it suggests a position that you could do, not one that you're going to do. But if we repudiate or disown Christ, uh, he will disown us in the day of judgment. You cannot disown the Lord. Well, I'm on the grave. I don't care if you disown him. You're going to get disowned yourself. Okay? And then the idea of unfaithfulness is in this final clause. It could render if we are faithless. You now, if we believe not, or if we're faithless, this contrasts with God's utter faithfulness. Even if we're faithless, he can't be unfaithful. He will abide in consistency with his word and do what his word says. He will not back off of that. Hallelujah. You can say Hallelujah. He cannot deny himself. Okay. Of these things, put them in remembrance. So again, again, a new, a, a new topic. Uh, you could call it the approved workman. Uh, it extends the end of chapter. It's extended to the end of this chapter. And Paul entrusts Timothy to remind and charge others. He was saying, don't engage in word fights. <laughs> Brother Bill, remember the days. Scripture wars on the radio. This week you preached how the healing wasn't for today. Next week we preached that it was. They came back and said it was spiritual. We came back and said it was physical. You know, I mean, it was scripture wars. They just took, you know, you had to have the cycles. You know, this week you had your whole radio program. The other guy came out and preached against your whole radio program. Next week you went back the next week and preached against his radio program. All right? Useless. Because the only ones amen are the people you got listening to your program to amen what you're saying about the guys on the program being wrong. Okay, they, these things result in no profit and subverting the, or ruin, the Greek says, literally turning upside down. So, you know, it says here, of these things put them in remembrance, charging bef- them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. So Paul says, listen, all this arguing about stuff isn't any good. Okay, you're going to subvert the hearers or turn them upside down. Next verse, he says, study. Here is the key. How do you deal with it? You study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word truth. So he says here, the word study has a much broader meaning than than book learning. It means to be eager, to be zealous, to be vigilant, to make effort, to do your uttermost. Now I've got, now Nathan's a senior. And um, he had courses in his, his four years, of in his three and a half years of college. He didn't give a rip about. Hello? He didn't care if the class dropped off into the abyss. You, I mean, you know, he just would struggle to get the work done, wait to the last possible second, and turn something in. Now, somehow or another, he managed to get through some stuff. Hallelujah. But now, now this semester he had a course called music history, and he just he just loved it. You didn't have to really stay on him a bit because he just he enjoyed it so much. He listened in class because he enjoyed it. 
Hello? He was eager to learn. Amen? He was zealous about it because he enjoyed it. All of his music classes, he's like that. Okay? That's them general college classes. You know? P.E. being taught by a, a, a masculine woman. We'll just leave it there. We ain't just talking about a tomboy. All right? No, this, the word study. Study. Be eager to learn. Be zealous to learn. Be diligent. Make every effort. Do your utmost. Peter was to do his best to show. That is to present yourself for service. Approved. Accepting. Accepted after testing. Proved means they, they tested you out and you proved you, you, you bore out your, your, your worth. Amen? Unto God. The presentation to God invoids, 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 involves two aspects. A worker who's not ashamed. Remember, it says, uh, uh, a worker who's not ashamed, who needeth not to be ashamed. So a worker who's not ashamed, and it means not to be put to shame in, in the future. And a worker who can rightly divide or correctly handle the word of truth is literally straight cutting. Now, I'll be honest with you. We, you know, we, uh, we replaced the carpet in the church a number of years ago. And... Um, uh, Went to, went to the thresholds of the doors and had to, you know, and I'd seen the guys do it a thousand times. So I know what to do. But I'm telling you, that ain't as easy as it looks cutting the threshold straight. Because you overlap the carpets and you put down a straight edge, but if you, if you got to hold it just right, you got to keep it just tight, the right tightness, and you got to keep that blade, you can't let it wobble as it's going through the carpet. Or it'll, it'll do like this. You got gaps. And if you go look at my thresholds, we got issues. But that's why I make sure I cut them on the inside where you can't see them from the outside on the hallway. That's why you don't know about it because I got them all hid. Okay? And see, with the, with the things of God and the word of God, we got to right, we got to straightly cut. We can't be wobbling out here. All right, it looks easy to go out there and just get up and preach a sermon. Yeah, you come up with some stupid stuff too. You can walk, walk around your church telling everybody the Lord told me the other day. Well, you know, what did the Lord tell you that didn't line up with his word? Did you go study it out to see if it lined up with the word? No, he told me. Well, you know, I don't care what he told you. And I don't mean that in, in disrespect to God, but people who always use God told me as a preface to what they're about to say, a lot of times, now let me ask you something. Now, let, can I just tell you as a congregation, you come to me, pastor, I need to talk to you, Okay. The Lord told me the other day, such and such, such and such, such and such. What do you think? Now, what am I supposed to say? I got two choices. Okay? Or, Dr. Phil, you're an idiot. <laughs> God didn't tell you that. But see, you know, you know, when people preface something with God told me, there's nothing you can really say about it. Because now I've got to call him a liar if not. Don't ever preface that when you're trying to get answer, you're getting, getting something. Pastor, I was, I was studying it, and, and, and I got this, but I'm not sure if it's accurate or not. What do you, what, what do you, what do you see about this? Well, what's the Bible? Then we can go talk about what the Bible says. All right? And we, may come to, we may end up coming to the same conclusion. We may not. But don't ever preface something with God told me. And then ask what somebody thinks. Now, if you're going to say God told me and not ask, okay. But I'm going to be honest with you. If you come to me and say, Pastor, God told me such and such. I know he showed me, the, he showed me this. And, and now what do you think? God, now, I, I can't argue with you. What am I going to say? So, you know, I'm not going to tell you anything. I'm just going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you anything. Because now we're going to have a fight. And you're going to lead the church. Might do it anyway, but you're going to lead the church faster than, sooner rather than later because Pastor Ed doesn't, doesn't, doesn't flow in the spirit. Because if he flowed in the spirit, he'd see this too. I said that some of the best Bible teachers in our, of our lifetime. And there are people that they say Brother Hagin said things that Brother Hagin didn't say. That people say that Lester Summerall said things that Lester Summerall didn't say. That people say things that brother, that brother Copeland said that Brother Copeland didn't say. Run out and blame it on them because they got a revy. Your revy is too heavy. All right? 
Thank you for your enthusiasm. No, study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing or straightly cutting the word of God. Amen. Pastors, ministers are supposed to do that. When you, when you think you have something, you want to come bounce it off somebody, come bounce it off of them, but bounce it off of them in the right way. Pastor, I'm, I, I'm not sure if this is right, but this is what I saw in this. Well, brother, now let's see. Now, what does the Bible say about this is this place? Well, da-da-da-da-da. Well, what does the Bible say about this in this place? Da-da-da-da-da-da. Now, based on, you know, these six or seven scriptures we just talked about, do you still think God told you that? Are you still thinking that's a biblical revelation? Well, according to those scriptures, it's not. Well, then what do you do? You missed it. And everybody in this room has missed it, including moi, more than once. Brother Bill's even missed it. He lost one of his doctorates over it. The doctorate of always right. <laughs> I'm just picking on Brother Bill tonight. What's that, Brother Bill? Uh-huh. Well, see, Brother Bill's old enough for the Lord to handle it. I'm just messing on him. I got, we get some people, you say something that will lead the church. All right. Let's move along before Brother Bill leaves. All right. <laughs> Another meaning for correctly handling, uh, right, the Bible correctly handling refers to Timothy's call to the correct exegesis of God's word. He must not twist or change the truth. And of course, the word of truth refers to the gospel. You can't twist or change the truth. You've got you to stay accurate with it. I don't care if it, sells, if it doesn't sell as many tapes and it doesn't sell as many programs and it doesn't sell as many books. We are not in the ministry to sell tapes, CDs, MP3s, or books, or thumb drives, or anything else. We're in the ministry to be charged with rightly handling, rightly dividing, correctly handling the word of truth. That is our job. It is not to sell stuff. Hello, but it funds my ministry. If you're changing the gospel to fund your ministry, go sell tents at J.C. Penney's. They don't sell them anymore. All right. Listen. He, then he warns him. But shame, but shame. Shun profane and vain babblings. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word will eat as doth a canker. Of whom is Hymenius and Philetus. Okay. Paul warned Timothy. Shun ungodless chatter. Empty words. Um, one person paraphrased it this way. To all these irreligious and frivolous hair, hair splittings, give a wide berth. Vain babblings is talk that is void of value and irrelevant in substance and spirit. The they in the second clause has two meanings. It could refer to the profane and vain babblings, and it could also refer to the false teachers who go on towards ungodliness. The next two verses refer to the, uh, the false teachers. Their word, that is the false teachers' words, will eat. The, uh, actually, here, listen to this. Will eat, the Greek word means to find pasture. So their word will find pasture. It'll, it'll, take, it'll take a place of setting in somebody's heart. The Greek word uh, was a medical term in Paul's day that designed a malignant sore that eats away at healthy tissue. The word canker. Eats away at healthy tissue. People get mad when we start teaching things like the extreme teaching on grace is not good. Why? Because the false side of that thing will eat away as a canker, as, as a cancer, a malignant growth. It'll eat away at healthy flesh. It'll take good. I remember. Now, Brother Bill remembers this. I'm sure he remembers this. He was in the church here with this, all this was going on. The, um, the Joshua generation. Yeah, he's laughing. He remembers. Somewhere about eight, late, really early 90s, early 90s, there was, there was a guy running around the country. And he started teaching this teaching called the Joshua generation. Now, the Joshua generation was all the young ministers who were going to come on the scene and take over and bump off all the old guys. Hagen's going, they're going to get rid of the Hagen's, going to get rid of the Summerall's, going to get rid of, um, you know, uh, the Fred Prices, get rid of, you know, the CM Wards, all those guys. We're just going to bump them out because we're, the we're the Joshua generation. We're the generation that took over Moses' place. Now, let me say something. Number one, you can't use that as a parallel to anything. 
Do you know why Moses didn't get to go in? He disobeyed. So in other words, the Joshua generation would have to mean that Hagen and Sumrall and all those guys and disobeyed. They struck the rock twice. They were in disobedience to God. That's why they had to be removed. So there, number one fallacy of the Joshua generation. Number two, Joshua was over 80 when he took over. He won't know some young whippersnapper. This was these, these are the 20s and 25-year-olds who were prophets and called of God, and they're taking over, and they got the word of the time and the season. They, they, they barely got out of the diapers, and they're going to take over the church. Well, this guy was going around the country teaching it, and everybody was having this guy in. I'm not going to call his name because there's it's, it's, it's no benefit to it. Some of you don't know who he is, and some of you, I'd rather not find out who he is and go listen to anything he has to say. Because it wasn't that many years ago, he was pastoring a church out in California and had to step down because he was living in homosexuality. And we had known in the church for decades, for about 15 years, he was a homosexual. But people were still having him in. Because drew big crowds. I knew people who, who, for a fact, could tell you, he came on to them. Personally know him. Well, anyway, that, that being set aside. <coughs> well, I had, I had a number of minister friends that come through our church, um, and one of them came to me. We were, we were talking, and, and um, he, said, uh, he said something about the guy, you know, just, well, I, you know, about what's going on. He said, Ed, listen. He said, I, I traveled in churches in about a six-month cycle behind him. Okay? So in other words, and you know how, how it was in that day. I mean, everybody went to the, and they all went to the same churches, and they, and they were kind of on a timetable behind each other. They were all having the same guys in all over the country. And uh, this guy said, look, he said, I, I, I travel. In, uh, my, I'm coming in somewhere in the neighborhood about six months after he is in most of these churches. <coughs> he says, he's been teaching this Joshua generation stuff. He said, here's what's happening. He said, it, it, he said every church I'm going in, all the young ministers are rising up overthrowing the pastor or going and splitting the church and starting their own churches because they're the Joshua generation. He's the old school and they need to get rid of him. Well, everybody's eating it up, buying the tapes, buying, back then buying tapes and CDs. Talking about how powerful it was, how anointed it was, but the fruit of it was split up churches. You know them by the fruit. So the fruit <coughs> was not churches that were more stable. The fruit was not churches that were blessed. The fruit was not a stability in young ministers. As a matter of fact, the young ministers, and see, of course, everybody goes, well, praise God, we got two churches instead of one. Now, you got one, you got two churches that are all messed up instead of one that's healthy. Are you here? So it doesn't help anybody. As a matter of fact, the kingdom is hurt and the community's hurt. Because you had a work there that was solid and stable until this came in. This junk got in there. And to be honest with you, a lot of pastors didn't know any better. They were just, they just, they invited in and then didn't do anything about it when it got taught. I've got them talk stuff behind people. I've said, listen, I said, so-and-so taught such as they're wrong. Forgive me for having them in. I, sh I should have heard better from the Holy Ghost. We, we, we make mistakes. At least when I tell you that I was wrong and that what they thought was wrong, you can go, okay. We can go, okay. Hallelujah. Can somebody uh, retrieve more? I believe that if I drink this water, I will not die. <laughs> mm. I'm not going to fall over in the pulpit, by the way. <coughs> So he says, um, so he says here, this, you know, their word does eat as a canker. It's, it's malignant, which is why it's so important that when doctrine is wrong, the pa listen, pastor, pastors are not like the traveling minister. Are you here? They get to come in, they get, and I don't, I don't say this in a, in a demeaning way, but the truth is they get to come in, blow in, blow up, and blow out. They get to come in and teach whatever that is on their heart for that season to teach in the churches, and it is an addition from in the body of Christ to the local church. It is legitimate, but the pastor can't just sit there and teach what the traveling minister comes in and teaches. 
or what the television ministry has out there that's teaching. They just can't sit around and teach all that. They got to teach other stuff like, this is Squirrel Zone. <laughs> this, is, this is granola Christian stuff. Fruits, nuts, flakes, all packaged together in the same box. Pastors have that responsibility. Yes, they need to teach the word of God. Yes, they need to rightly divide the word of truth. Yes, they need to teach the whole counsel of the word. But when stuff is flaky, they got to tell you it's flaky. You don't get many traveling guys coming in telling you something's flaky. Sometimes they're the ones that's teaching it that it's flaky. And they're flaky. Hello? So don't get mad at your pastor because he's not spending every service teaching on warring tongues. That was another thing that was out there about that same time. So the, but anyway, back, back to this traveling guy because he's saying when I went out and taught, taught warring tongues, they get in church and scream in tongues for hours at the devil. I mean just sit there and scream at the devil. Couldn't even talk the next day because they had screamed so long and so loud in tongues, fighting the devil. They lost their voice. Bless their hearts. As Brother Hagin used to say, bless their hearts and stupid heads. Hello. Well, Pastor, you know, listen, he had flaky people. Some man came into a church. He's sitting, he's sitting there preaching in the church. And the woman on the front row just rocking back and forth like this. And finally he says, Sister, what are you doing? Well, she said, Well, Brother So and so came into the, to the church a little while back, and he laid hands on me and imparted into me the gift of rocking. He said, Well, what's that? She said, When you're in the spirit, I'm rocking. And when you're not, I'm not. He said, Sister, that's what I call laying empty hands on empty heads. Hallelujah. I said, hallelujah. Hey, you can't impart the gift of rocking to somebody. Dear Lord. You know? I mean, people can't get all kinds of stuff. You know? And, 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 and because he did it in the church, the pastor didn't know anybody. He thought, well, that's got to be a gift of the Spirit. That's, gotta be, that's the Holy Ghost. We love, I love the Holy Ghost too, but the Holy Ghost ain't a fruitcake. Hello? I even doubt if he eats fruitcake at Christmas. That's a joke. Come on now. I don't. Under any circumstance. That candied whatever it is in there, I ain't eating. Now you, I remember grandma used to have it, and I'd, I'd go in there and dig out all the fruit and eat some of the cake. It was fruitless cake. We're not going to finish 2 Timothy by the end of the year, are we? All right. Now listen to this. Now I've been told you're not supposed to call people's names. But here he says of his Hymenius and Philetus, and Paul names Hymenius twice in his writings as one who's departed from the faith. And in this case, Philetus' name is his cohort. And they both, both names appear separately among those of Caesar's household whose relics have been found in Columbian, uh, Colum, uh, Columbia area vaults at Rome. Man, they, say, they got hooked up with the Romans. Really bad. Okay? Who concerning the truth. Now, he didn't hide their name, did he? He just flat out said who they were. Who concerning truth have erred saying that the resurrection has passed already and over. And listen, why is it important in some cases to name people? Because they're going around overthrowing the faith of people. They're me that's right, they're messing folk up. Oh, but they're such a sweet Christian. They're messing folk up. They're drawing them out from under their covering. And I'm, listen, I'm not saying that, only, that I'm the only pastor in the world that can ever pastor people. But I'm telling you, the devil will try to get you out from under the place God planted you. And, he'll, and they'll use people who develop relationships who themselves have erred from the truth and they'll overthrow the faith of others. That's why sometimes you have to say who they are. Don't do it in every case. You're not trying to hurt people. 
But if they're going to mess up people, we got to do something about it. And when they're going around messing up folk, and then people get mad at me. They get ticked off with me. Well, bless your heart. Didn't do it to hurt you. Didn't do it to hurt them. Trying to make sure they don't overthrow your faith. Hello? Okay. Erred means to wander away. Uh, in this case, they say that they were probably teaching there was no bodily resurrection, but only a spiritual resurrection. This spiritualized and destroyed the faith of some believers because the res resurrection, the physical resurrection, is one of the central truths of the gospel. The word overthrow means can mean to overturn, upset, ruin, or destroy. Paul was determined not to let people overturn or ruin or destroy people's faith. It's not just on this subject. There's other subjects that can mess people up. Hello? And so, uh, <coughs> just in case, Paul had no qualms about declaring who, who was doing something wrong. In other cases, he would just say there are some. It wasn't, it wasn't, you know, okay, somebody does something wrong, we're naming you. That's, that's, not, that's not the deal. But if it happens, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't get bothered about it. You shouldn't get flustered about it. Paul did it. Matter of fact, one guy, he called him twice. He got, and they, listen, uh, some of the letters were circular letters, got around all over the place. Well, love covers a multitude of sin. Not when it will injure others. If their actions are injurious to others, it has to be dealt with. Amen. Thank you. Okay. Um, nevertheless, the foundation of God, even though they're trying to do stuff, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knows them that are, on his, that, that are his, and that everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, do, do what? Everyone in the name of the name of Christ, do what? Do what? Depart from what? Really? I thought we, we could do whatever we wanted to do. It didn't matter. If you're going to name Christ, act. You know, can, can I paraphrase this modern day English? If you're going to name Christ, act like it. Well, I messed up. Hey, hey, see, we, we, we think it, we're making it hard on people. When people mess up, we have remedy. When people sin, there's remedy. You repent, ask God to forgive you. He cleanses you. You go forward. He doesn't hold it against you. He doesn't condemn you for it. He doesn't hold you in captivity to it. He's not going to try to make you feel bad about what you did when you repent. There's remedy for it. But the fact is that if you name Christ, depart from iniquity. You don't live there anymore. Don't try to, under the guise of walking in love and trying to make people not feel bad, bind them to that which makes them feel bad. What? The iniquity. Deliver them. Depart from it. But I, I did such as, then repent. The word of God says he'll forgive you. He'll cleanse you. When you, when, when you need grace, come to the throne of grace. That you'll receive mercy in that hour. You got to Come. You can't lay down and holler, I'm under grace, and get away with it. It's the, we, we, get it we get it backwards. Grace is not there to cover you in sin. Grace is there to empower you to overcome sin. Well, what covers me in sin? When you come to him, the blood covers you, and though your sins be red as scarlet, they be made white as wool. The cleansing takes place. And then you lean on the grace not to do it again. It's that simple. I said, that's, it's just that simple. Did I get it? That's, that's a good teaching back there. All right. Brother Bill's, Brother Bill's giving me good teaching signs back there. Amen. Let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house, there's not only vessels of gold and silver, but also wood and earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor. 
Now, I've heard people use this scripture to teach that God makes some folks honorable and some folks dishonorable, but the Bible says if you'll purge yourself. So it's not that God made you that way. It is what you did with what he gave you. What you did with the grace that he gave you. Did you use it to empower you to purge and to overcome? Or are you trying to use it to cover up and get away with? If you are, then you're a vessel into dishonor. Listen to this. He shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared for every good work. How? Because he purges himself from iniqu uh, iniquities. How do you purge yourself from iniquities? You follow the word. You spend time in the presence of God. You repent when you do wrong. You keep yourself in, before God, and you allow that work to continue on a, a regular basis. Hello? You're not, listen, now yeah, it's all works. No, I'm not dependent on my pure, sheer will and ability not to sin. The grace of God in me has brought an empowerment that when I cooperate with that empowerment, it keeps me. Amen. How do I cooperate with that empowerment? I recognize I'm unable not to. I know I don't need to. So then I go to the Lord and say, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for your strengthening grace, your empowering grace that empowers me to say no to that thing that wants to have a hold of me, that has had a hold of me in the past. I say no to it, and I thank you that your grace empowers and strengthens me to say, to say no and to do no, to walk it out. Glory to God. I say glory to God. I just don't go like Flip Wilson and his alter ego of Geraldine and say, the devil made me do it, honey, and I'm on the grace. Some of y'all remember Flip Wilson. Used to watch that show every week, the Flip Wilson show. Geraldine was the pre precursor to Medea. <laughs> You need to picture that gun with her cock saying, say you're under grace one more time. <laughs> All right. So if you purge yourself from what? These things that are dishonorable. These things that are iniquity. If you purge yourself from them, you'll be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet. Meet means um, made for or um, prepared for the master's use. Into every good work. Paul now comes. <laughs> there are just times I just can't understand how people come up with stuff they come up with. If you tell us to do anything, it's worse. Paul said, flee also youthful lust. He didn't say, you know, you're going to have youthful lust, just, but you're under grace, it's okay. He said, flee them. Are you here? Flee useful us. Then he says, um, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. Flee means to shun, to avoid. And um, the youthful us in various translations, when the NIV says uh, evil desires of the heart, the RSV says youthful passions, uh, Phillips says turbulent desires of youth. Timothy is told to run away, flee, run away from these. Why? He tells them to follow, to pursue, to follow after. What? Righteousness, faith, charity, peace. This repeats what Paul wrote in the first letter to Timothy, uh, with the exception of peace. Faith includes the idea of integrity, uh, reliability, faithfulness, charity, agape, seeks the highest good for others, and peace denotes a right relationship with God and men. Then he cautions Timothy, don't have anything to do with foolish and stupid arguments because they know, that, know they produce quarrels. See, I've learned when people start down a certain path, just walk away. I ain't even going to talk to you about it. Because you can't fix stupid. God can, but I can't. God's got to deal with them, okay? Knowing they gender strife. And then verse 24, he says, The servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. He calls them to be the servant of the Lord. 
uh, and, and, and really as a special ministry he's given, he must not strive, must not get embroiled in quarrels or word battles. He's got to be gentle, that is kind. So I don't tell people to their face they're stupid. <laughs> I might think it, but I don't say it. Okay? Even when he has to point out a fault in another, he must be apt or able to teach. He's skillful in the important position of Christian character. He must be patient, that is forbearing, bearing evil without resentment. And he possesses an attitude of patient forbearance towards those who oppose him. In meekness, instructing those who oppose himself, uh, means those, here he means, uh, must in meekness instruct those who oppose himself. The meaning here, he's gentle and corrects others with kindness, self-control. That's why I can't look at you and call you stupid to your face. And a humility that is willing to forgive. Now, let me say something here. Somebody comes in here and they've, they've done certain, you, you can ask them. No one's ever come to our church that's done things and messed our church up. I have never told anybody to get out. As a matter of fact, we put our arm around and say, we love you. Oh, we forgave you for that for a long time ago. Ask anybody that's ever come back. Ask them. And, that's, you know, and, and they just have to lie to say something different. Okay. Of those who oppose themselves are people who set themselves up as opponents of, to God's servant by false teaching and immoral conduct. And they that may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taking captivity at his will. The purpose of God's gift of repentance is this. It is seen that they may recover. That they may return to soberness. They're like drunk on, on power or false doctrine. Themselves out of a trap of the devil. These people have taken captive. That is, they've been caught alive. And it's only used here. In this one passage. By the devil to do what? His will. Which is wreak havoc and destruction on the church. Satan wants to put, bring destruction on the church. Y'all here, you going home. All right. We trust that you were blessed by the word of God and the flow of the spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.